that term, where that term sort of transferred over. And uh, the only study that I could find was uh, in 1976 that talked about androgen binding uh, saturation. But um, if they're basing their views on stuff that's that old, they, it's uh, completely outdated by now. Okay, we're live, guys. All right. Okay, so welcome everyone uh, to this uh, live stream. So this is the TOT Doctors uh, Roundtable. And tonight we have uh, on our uh, panel, uh, Dr. Keith Nichols, Dr. Scott Howell and Danny Bossa. How are you guys? All right, Thank you, Steven. Doing great. So as you probably already know, these guys together with many others are in our closed and still free and always will be free Facebook group, TRT and Hormone Optimization Therapy, HOT. So, and if you are watching this, you surely must be interested. And if you haven't already, please join that group. The link you will find under the video. First, we will have some prepared questions for our panel. And afterwards, we will take uh, your questions from the Q&A live stream chat box. I see also already some people in there. Hello, Ali Atapur, always in there, my friends. <laughs> so, the prepared questions. To stick with the content that we brought to the YouTube channel recently, Let's talk about bro science uh, for a moment. Why is it that bro science is so hard to find, eh, Danny? Why do people tend to rather believe the bros on the forums than the meta-analysis of uh, hundreds of valid studies? And why do people like Danny uh, get so much of negative comments, next to all the positives, of course, if they try to defend evidence-based science rather than bro science? And last thing, why do people defend what they already believe in? So maybe you start, Danny. Yes. Sure. Um, so with me, it took me a long time to kind of figure out how all this stuff worked. And when I say figure out, I mean, when I was at going to bro science school, there was just so much stuff to learn and everybody had a different perspective. And you would have to figure out, you know, if you're in a given forum, who are the, the veterans of that forum? Who are the ones that have been there the longest? And who are the newbies? And who are the newbies looking up to? And these veterans, which ones have the, seem to have the best information, talk the most technical talk and whatever, and just kind of grasp everything you're doing. And then you'd go on other forums and try to piece together little bits to figure out, okay, this seems to be the best, the best way of doing things based on, you know, everybody looks up to this guy, he's saying this and everyone looks to that guy. So let me put that into practice. So you put it into practice. And I mean, you do feel better coming from a non-TRT base. You know, you're adding, at one point you add any type of testosterone, you're going to feel better. Um, so I got to feel better. And then when I started seeing some doctors who would challenge some of the ideas I had, I'd get really stubborn because now at this point, I've invested hundreds, if not thousands of hours of reading and reading and research and forums and this and this and that. So it's like, how dare you challenge all this, this, this reading and all this literature and all this stuff that I've gone through, all these discussions I've gone through with guys who've been on TRT for 10 years or 15 years, and this is what the people online say, and you're just a doc and you just have a couple of patients this way. And I would argue, and I'm, a, I'm Italian, like we all know, I'm hard-headed as hell and I love to argue, and I would argue with all of them. And it was only later on when, you know, Keith started saying, you know, ditch the AI and it just went against everything I had read and I knew you knew your stuff and Scott knew his stuff but then I was like but that completely goes against the last four years of everything I've ever learned how can this be and I at first I didn't believe him because it's not just being stubborn it's just based on this is all I've been reading for the last many many years and it took a long time for me to get through my head that you know, well, that wasn't the right way. It's this way. And then when I implemented, I saw, you know, it's, it's true. And then when I saw everybody else implementing, I said, you, know, you can see that the outcome, uh, the benefits they were getting was true. You know, at the end of the day, I find just because you've been doing something for so long doesn't mean it's the right way. You know, imagine uh, an analogy I thought of today is a, a carpenter who's been using the same tool and he's been using the same tool for 40 years and he's and he's, he's a fantastic carpenter but he always has a, a a wrist that hurts you know and one day you walk over and he's like yeah it's, you know my wrist has been hurting for a long time so well you know if you just put your thumb like that over the handle instead of the other way it'll relieve a lot of pressure 
and you, if someone who's open-minded to suggestions is like, oh, I'll try it out. You know, I've only been doing this for 40 years, but let me try out your thing. They try it out and it's like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, for 40 years, I've been doing it the wrong way. And this is now <laughs> demonstrated as the right way. Look, my, my wrist doesn't hurt. So you just, you just got to go into this thing thinking that whatever you know right now, like I keep saying, could all be bullshit. You just keep an open mind. Someone makes a suggestion, look into it, ask others that, that know their stuff. And especially people like, you know, Scott and Keith, someone wants to challenge Scott on androgen receptors as an example. It's like, like good luck. You know, I see, I've, I've posted the video he did on androgen receptors in some of these forums like T Nation. And they just like, yeah, whatever. He's, he's a nobody. He's not what I'm talking about. I'm like, the guy does this for a living. Like, go to the ones that do this, you know, actively, active research for a living. Anyways, what do I know? Well, hey, Keith. Keith? Yeah, uh, I think Danny said it correctly. By the way, it's intimidating to talk to Scott even in the office, Danny. So um, I'll tell you that. I know. It comes to the research aspect of things for sure. Uh, but, you know, uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, belief perseverance, I guess we'll say. And guys just, uh, it becomes like a religion to them and they're so stuck in it. And, you know, I don't know if it's uh, to some degree a little bit of insecurity to, to admit that maybe uh, I don't know as much as I thought I did or, or what I've been teaching is wrong when it comes to those forums. But, but it's difficult to change, I will say, and I've made this very public before. Uh, Dr. Rousier is uh, not only a close friend, but he's my mentor. And I spent the first two or three years uh, with him trying to dispel everything that he was teaching since it was so different uh, than what I had read and learned. Uh, I took an aromatase inhibitor myself for several years, and I actually prescribed them, even though he was showing me the medical evidence uh, otherwise. Uh, but after years of literally trying to find literature or data to support uh, the use of one, I couldn't. And so uh, my wife, as, as y'all know, I was the one that finally said, look, you've got you've to follow evidence-based medicine. You do everywhere else, but you continue to take that AI and, and you need to stop and stop now. And I was like Danny and a lot of other men, I had those estrogen symptoms from time to time. Felt a little bloated here. Maybe my erection wasn't as strong as I thought it should be. And so take that AI and sure enough, a day or two or so later, things got better. So I would associate that AI and that estrogen with those symptoms I was having. So once I stopped it, I really had to literally throw it away. Just had to get rid of it or you'd reach for it. You just have to get rid of it. And once I did, I have to admit the first week or two or three, I, I mean, I really wanted to reach for it because I would feel that I was getting some of those symptoms. And then after a month or two, you, you go, life goes on. You, for, you just forget about it because you get busy doing other things. And then you look back and go, my God, I'm not, not having any of those symptoms. Things are, things, things are great. And they and actually continue to get better. So, uh, but, you know, the, the main thing is uh, when I first started into this, I, you know, I had pellets inserted to me because I was mismanaged. And so I thought the pellets going to be the way I was going to go. That, that, you know, the Southeast at that time, you know, we talked about over a decade ago, was a big pellet factory. So I thought that's the way I would go. But once I started learning about that and realizing that was not the best way, well, you know, I, I evolved. And so I've done it every way imaginable. And I've just never felt this uh, desire or this need to just stay static in my thinking. I'm always looking to try to improve things because for Christ's sake, I, I have to take the hormones myself. My family is on the hormones. My wife is on those hormones. So I certainly want to do what's best for them and, and myself, so I uh, I don't get the, uh, the the static thinking, but it's certainly there. You know, I've, I've tried to teach like Danny did a couple of years ago. I've made several attempts, and all it does is end up in complete frustration. And you just you know get yourself saying, why did I even attempt to do this? You know, uh, but what's funny? What I was uh, what I was uh, posting on Excel Mail a couple of years ago now has come to you know now it's, now it's come to pass and. Now we're not using AIs like like they like they always did, and you know uh, I think a lot of men are coming around to the understanding that you don't have to you know lobotomize while you're on testosterone. You can if you want to. If you if you're afraid of that number, you certainly can. But in over 80 years of testosterone use, I can't tell you it's caused a heart attack, stroke, or blood clot in any randomized control trial. So you know the hematocrit issue is uh, is something that's uh, that's a what I what do I call them a, a uh, a little monster in the closet that's that's not really there uh, as was the estrogen as was uh, it caused prostate cancer to grow it's like pouring gasoline on a fire i mean we've really you know come around our ways of thinking and and you have to be open open to the to the literature and the research but if you specifically follow the literature and the literature only uh 
you realize you don't need to bleed, you don't need to take an AI because there's no literature to support those. And so uh, that's just where I, where I go with it. I'm out, we're always looking for something uh, new and I'm always looking for ways to change. I, I get pigeonholed into the scrotal application testosterone. That's one I personally use, I like it a lot. But hey, injections work well too. I mean, either way it works. It's just, you gotta, whatever way you choose, you gotta stick with it and, and do it the best way that you can. And I, you know, as Danny and Scott and you, Stephen, we all know, I mean, I think a daily application of anything uh, is the best way to go. But if I, but hopefully if their research paper comes out, shows otherwise, then we'll go with that application method for sure. Okay, Scott, you have um, uh, experience with the bro science? Well, yeah. What do you do with it? Experience with bro science. Um, I think I'm the only one here. Maybe, Stephen, you haven't taken an AI. Have you? Never. No, no. I, I've never taken an AI. Um, I just, it, I, I never did. I could have. I could have been in that situation to do so, but just never did. So uh, some of the stuff with the AIs I really don't understand because I've never actually taken one. I've never experienced uh some of the uh, things with symptoms like uh, Keith had mentioned, but I look at uh, bro science sort of like motor learning. And Keith and I uh, talked about this briefly to today, but uh, people believe what they know, what they've come to know is truth. And when they learn this bad information, it's like when you are trying to learn a new sporting movement, there's a pattern in neuromuscular activ activation that occurs. There's different motor units that are recruited. And uh, this pattern becomes reinforced over and over again. So when somebody learns something and they hear it from all these people over and over, it becomes reinforced. Now with motor units, the, the repetition and various types of feedback work to uh, make the motor program more efficient. Well, the problem is when you learn a faulty motor program, all the work that it took to actually gain uh, what would be a, a good motor program, um, it actually takes more work than that. It's hard to relearn a motor program once it's ingrained in the mind. Um, and it, uh, sometimes some athletes cannot be untrained out of that movement once they learn it. So uh, when I look at this, when uh, when people defend their, their beliefs, they go to all these great links. Uh, some people like, uh, we all know fanatics, zealots, like with the low carb zealots that uh, Steve and I talk about. They never have room to update their beliefs. And I'm, this, I'm sort of jumping ahead because I got some notes uh, for later, but this perspective is a dichotomy. It's everything is either black or white. It's either yes or no. It's either take an AI or no AI. Um, and when you get locked into this perspective, there is, is, is not room to update your beliefs. Um, so in science, things are never like this. Things are never a dichotomy. There's always some type of uncertainty. And we try to measure that uncertainty by statistical analysis. And we have to keep our minds open to update our beliefs based on current evidence. So this goes even further uh, from the motor program analogy. And it has a lot to do with social behavior science as well. Um, I, I don't know if any of you uh, know about this, but there's a thing in social sociology called in-groups and out-groups. And when someone becomes a part of an in-group, <clears throat> They learn to be, they have common behaviors, common actions, uh, common interest that drive them to seek information from that group. And then whenever there's an out group, one of us that's talking about different information, they automatically perceive it as being discredited. Uh, so I think the tendency in this in group out group uh, perspective is a lot of what drives uh, bro science and not being able to update the uh, uh, belief systems. Um, and the interesting thing here is this is an attribution error. And it's one of the fundamental concepts in sociology. And I never really see it talked about when we talk about bro science. 
uh, there's a thing called the uh, fundamental attribution error. And that's when an in-group perceives someone in an out-group, they have some issue in life, maybe that uh, uh, they had a hard time or uh, something happened to them. Well, they always look for personal aspects related to that failure. And that's an attribution error. So I think this is linked in uh, to attribution. You know, it's uh, it's also, it's, it's really just human nature. Uh, I think everybody's heard of the herd mentality mm -hmm. where people are uh, essentially like, like sheep in that, uh, in that we're influenced by our peers to adopt behaviors that are uh, largely emotional rather than rational. We make different decisions uh, based on that than we would if we were an individual. And so that Leeds University did a study, but it showed that it only takes 5% of people to act like they know what they're talking about or to be confident to influence 95% of other people. So that's what goes on with the forums. If you have these very confident, we know it all moderators and the sheep come in and they follow what those moderators teach. So it is literally the herd mentality. Everybody needs to just Google herd mentality and look at the study done at Leeds, L-E-E-D-S uh, University. And you'll see that's just what, where we are as human beings. And, and that's our nature. And that's what the, uh, that's what the forums are. And you'll notice that different forums, uh, they all have different, a little bit different ideas, but they all have the same idea. And if somebody comes in like Danny that wants to question those ideas, they're, they're ostracized, kicked out, attacked. Uh, even though Danny is right, you still are, you're fighting against the herd mentality of that forum. Exactly. Been, uh, a few times actually where, when I made that transition from I need an AI to I don't, I said, okay, well, this AI business, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out there who say, well, I take an AI, I feel fine. You, f you feel fine. You know, I used to smoke cigarettes. I used to smoke cigarettes and feel fine. Doesn't mean it was good for me, right? Um, but there was a time that I said, okay, I, I think I need to have an open mind and move to the, to, the, to the no AI thing. And like I say in a lot of my podcasts, I had some very mild gyno that I got from way before I even started TRT, which, uh, you know, surprisingly to a lot of people was due to actually low test the testosterone. My, my estradiol, I think, was like at 11 or 12. It was super low. So it wasn't estradiol induced uh, gyno. But when I stopped the AI, uh, one thing one thing with me is I, I, anytime I would have anything estrogenic, like even if I would eat soy or something like that it would kind of flare up. I would feel it swell. It would hurt. And then a couple of days later, it would go down. So I would stop the AI. And, you know, we'd literally within two days, I would feel that swelling. I'm like, oh, no, you see, I, I need my AI. I need my AI. And I would just get back on. The, the second I saw the slightest little change in my physiology, I'd say, well, there's no AI I think is nonsense. Obviously, those guys are right. I've demonstrated it. I need it. And the, 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 the problem with a lot of these people is they just – don't have faith in the process. Like, listen, you're going to feel something somewhere when you're going to stop this because yes, you're, 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 you've are you been keeping a certain hormone low and now you're not. And now that hormone is going to start to rise and everything that those supporting hormones are going to, are going to adjust. And you might feel, you know, Hey, my little bit of gas starts swelling up. Oh, or I might uh, be retaining a little water or I might be feeling like this or, Hey, so I tell this guys sometimes just to avoid all this. I say, sometimes you might even feel worse before you feel better. You might go through a week or two that you just feel all weirded out. And then after that, it's just gone. And that's what happened with me. The gyno started flaring up. And I said, oh, I'm going to have faith in Keith. I'm just going to stick to it. And then it just stabilized. And then it started shrinking back. And then it shrunk to like less than it was when I had the damn AI. So it's like, and now I'm off. And it's like, there's so many things that have improved over time. It's for me, it's that. I'm glad you brought that up. And I know you've made a few posts recently, but. It's not just that, uh, it's just almost anything when guys start on testosterone or they change something, look, you gotta give it a little time to work and you may have a, a little nipple sensitivity, you may have a little uh, water retention, you may have maybe uh, a softer erection, for, but let things have a week or two to kind of acclimate, give your body a chance to, with, without knee jerking and changing something because you'll never, get to where you want to be. We've all been through that. I mean, I went through a phase where some decreased sensitivity and uh, decreased reach, reaching a, you know, a climax. I mean, it was just, uh, but it passed. It just, you just give it time and, and it will pass in the majority of cases. It's just the guys are not patient enough to, to let it pass. I'll, I'll consistently get 
well, for the last few days, well, for the last few days. And I'm like, well, give it a week or two. And, and you know, just, you know, they want to, uh, they want to change everything on a few days. I think Dr. Matsky is good about uh, posting uh, things like that about guys don't, don't make a change on every little, you know, if the wind blows a different direction one day, it's not, you don't need to make a change. Uh, give things time to settle in. Yeah. Yeah, if you guys are really worried about that, just wean yourself off the damn thing slowly. Don't say, well, I'm going to drop my AI all at once and uh, I'm getting issues. Say, well, I'll take a little less this week and next week I'll take a little less. And I'll take a little. And if you want, wean yourself off slowly and let that, that rise kind of be a kind of a controlled rise. And, and eventually you're going to just realize like, okay, I don't need it anymore. I'm done. I'm, I'm fine. That's it. Go ahead, Scott. You know, Sorry. Um, when you mentioned feelings, uh, that sort of uh, struck home with me because a lot of the things I deal with are, uh, with people and they're having problems, even with the AIs is they focus on moment to moment, how they feel. And I think that's one of probably the worst things to do in with anything, whether it be nutrition, training, hormone optimization or anything. Um, it is not the, what you feel at this moment. It is not what you feel in, 10 moments during this day. It's not all the moments in a week. It's not all the moments in two weeks. It is how you feel over a longer period of time. And I think that a lot of people get stuck into this. Well, if I don't feel this certain way right now, then there has to be something wrong. And one of the uh, aspects that Keith and I uh, talked about was uh, when it, it, that relates to hormones. I mean, some of the hormones that could be optimized or, or may be optimized, you're not going to feel them. Why do you optimize them? You optimize them for the health benefit, for the pre preventative medicine aspect. It's not to change a state. And a lot of guys that have a state, uh, they, they are either, uh, either depressed or they have uh, certain feelings that they repeat over and over, that is a long-term issue that has nothing to do with hormone optimization. And I, I think Keith, uh, um, do, do you have any th thoughts on that? Uh, I echo your uh, words. Exactly. Exactly. Because uh, with even like melatonin, if someone uh, uh, is wanting to feel something from melatonin, they might feel some jet lag the next day before they get used to it, but they're not taking it uh, for that purpose. They're taking it for anti-cancer properties. Uh, the same with DHEA, with different uh, areas and other hormones. So um, that's probably the biggest issue I have and struggle with people in communication and why I never, ever believe 100% of what people post on the forums when they tell me about what's going on with it. When someone posts in the forum, they, they did this, 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 and this, and uh, they, they aren't feeling this way or this isn't working. I look at it and I think that there's at least 30 or 40% of the information that is missing. And what you will find with you, Danny, uh, with in, being involved in these forums and stuff is that people selectively omit key information uh, maybe information they don't want to put out, maybe uh, information just because they don't think about it. But in my experience, it's, they purposely admit some information there. And um, it, to me, it would be so much easier if people stopped focusing on the feeling from day to day. Because if they did, over time, I mean, I have bad days. Keith, Keith has bad days. Steven, Danny, you all have bad days. Myself, if I'm locked into having a depressed mood more than a month, then I might start thinking more about it. But anytime I start to feel a certain way and it's not the state I want, I immediately start doing something else uh, instead of mulling over uh, the issue. But um, that's just sort of when uh, Danny mentioned uh, the feelings and then you followed up, that's the first thing that sort of popped in my head um, about it. So, yeah, guys. Thanks for this uh, insightful uh, info on the uh, bro science. Uh, that's a debunk for sure. 
So, I'll add something really, really quick, uh, just to make you guys all laugh. I've known now for a good long while that this like AI business is is nonsense and E2 is good. And, and it has still happened on occasion that I'm having a bad day and I have a little voice in my brain that goes, maybe your E2 is getting too high. And I said, <laughs> what? What? Will you shut up? Like <laughs> that's how ingrained this bro science gets that and how difficult it is to unlearn that there's still parts of your brain that are still hanging on by a thread to this nonsense that you've just brainwashed yourself with. It's, it's really that. So, Well, Danny, it's not easy. Um, it's not it, updating beliefs is not easy. It took me decades. And I mean, it took me decades to be able to challenge my beliefs and be able to, to change my beliefs. Um, given evidence, when somebody has a convincing argument, I don't now just automatically try to to cut their argument down. I look at the evidence first, and then if I still have issues, then I'll go back to the, to the person. But what I found is that this aspect of changing your beliefs in the face of evidence is probably, it was, for me, it was the hardest life lesson I ever learned. And in science, things are never black and white. They're always shades of gray. And one of the things that happens in the forums is someone will, will post a study and then they'll say, oh, look, this guy changed his mind or this or that. Why wouldn't we want to listen to that person that changed their mind? They had new data, they updated their beliefs, and now they're informing everybody else. So this whole thing about being wishy-washy as sort of a, a crossover if the person is genuine and they are really trying to convey a message, then don't attack the person. Look at the message and see if it has any value. I, uh, most people on the forums never develop the maturity to interpret the evidence on their own and base their own opinion. So if they're going to take information secondhand, then it just seems logical if they want the truth to discover the truth and interpret the evidence on their own but it's hard and um when studies get published in news and it says oh we changed our our path on this or we changed our path on that that's great we changed our path because we had better evidence that's how science works it yeah. is not ais are great forever and then they're not you, you see what i mean it is you have to update your beliefs in the face of evidence and if you don't have the evidence and you don't have the answer, you say, I don't know. I, I don't know is the best answer sometimes. I'll find out, I'll look into it, but just giving an opinion when you have no evidence and you're just providing an opinion and now you might have 100 people read that post and say, oh, this is the way it works. That's just the worst thing. Uh, just make sure that you know what you're saying when you say it. Exactly. Okay, next thing. It seems logical to optimize or change only one hormone or parameter at a time. But then again, I know, Keith, uh, you like to immediately optimize several hormones at once. Testosterone, pregnenolone, DHEA, all for their benefits, of course. But if other doctors now want to start or want to be educated on that matter, uh, what do we recommend them? Uh, one parameter at a time or just change uh, all the hormones you know they can benefit you? Keith. You can do what you want. I mean, you can start one at a time. You can start them all. I think that the guys that tend to gravitate toward one at a time are simply looking at the feel-good benefits of the hormones. Uh, the ones that start them all at once, such as the Rousiers of the world, we're looking at a preventive medicine program. We're looking at taking middle-aged people. We're not just focused on the feel-good now. We are focused on what we're going to do for these people 20 and 30 years down the road. So I say this all the time. I've said it on these podcasts. I tell every one of my patients this. There are only really two, and, and people argue this. Don't, let's don't nitpick little things. But there are two feel-good hormones. You know when you're deficient and you know when you get it. I could take any, any, any man, and he could be deficient in every hormone, and I could just give him back sufficient quantities of testosterone and thyroid. He's going to feel better. I could take that same man and only give him everything but testosterone and thyroid. He's not going to feel much better. So those are the really the two feel good hormones. I know people say, well, when I take DHEA, I can really tell. I understand that. We're talking about in general, 
as a whole, there are two feel good hormones. Okay. So why do I, why do we and Dr. Rousier and uh, other, other physicians like him start them all at the same time? Because we're practicing preventive medicine. Most of the guys that uh, are on the forums or even in the Facebook, they're typically be younger in their thirties or even late twenties. And they're, they're looking for the feel good. Now I want to feel good now. And if I take my testosterone and I, I see it all the time, I mean, Danny writes it. I see that, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Darko writes it. Uh, well, just take your testosterone. And if you feel much better then they're just going to show you that you don't need the others. Okay. Well, it goes against what I'm about to tell you as far as the way we're looking at it versus just the feel good now uh, component. Now, Danny will argue, well, if you start everything at once and then you have a side effect, you don't know which one it is. Oh, you've got a good idea if you've been doing it long enough. But honestly, people that have problems with bioidentical hormones, the individual one, are not that many. Okay, now a person may have a problem. You may have three out of 300 have a problem with pregnenolone, for instance. Let's just say you don't have erections, Danny. But that's not the 98% of people that you actually see. So we don't want to base everyone's long-term health based on what a small population of people have. So let's talk about DHEA. Don't start it if you don't want to go from a catabolic uh, metabolism to an anabolic metabolism, okay? If you want to improve your memory, take it. It increases energy, stimulates the immune system. It has anti-cancer properties. It improves mood and vitality. It's an antidepressant. It protects against osteoporosis. It decreases insulin requirements. It's an antioxidant. It decreases visceral body fat, therefore reduces cardiovascular risk. It reduces inflammation. It reduce, uh, protects against muscle atrophy. So with that said, if you don't want those properties, don't take it. It works synergistically with your other hormones like testosterone as well. But I will ask any member this, tell me what an anti-cancer property or cancer prevention feels like. You know what it feels like, Danny? Nope. I've never felt anti-cancer properties, but I certainly want them to you. Mm -hmm. and take your DHEA. Okay. So same thing. Uh, pregnenolone. We'll get into pregnenolone. Danny has trouble with erections with it. Okay, Danny, don't take pregnenolone or that, that's, that's okay. But for the majority of us, we want it to take it because it's a memory enhancer. It improves cognition. It improves cellular repair, particularly in the brain and the nervous system. Uh, it's being studied as a potential therapeutic agent for brain-related disorders. It's neuroprotective. Uh, it works for stress, anxiety, depression, psychosis-related disorders. Uh, so if you don't want that, don't take it. Uh, there, nobody forces anybody to, and you, and you can choose not to take it. But if you can tolerate it, why would you want, not want those properties? And that's what Dr. Ruzzi asked all the time. Why would you not want to optimize all your hormones? Because they all have some individual effects of their own in addition to being synergistic with the other hormones, but why would we not to why would we not want to optimize all of them and be at the upper end of the normal range with all to get all those beneficial effects? Uh, melatonin, man, yeah, of course it improves sleep, but that's not why I really take it. It is a potent antioxidant. I mean, it uh, it has powerful anti-cancer properties, especially prostate, breast, colorectal. I mean, one in six or seven men are gonna get prostate cancer, one in six or seven women breast cancer. Who wouldn't want all the protection that you can get? And you're not going to get the protection if you start it once you've got it. I mean, it is used to treat cancers as well, but you want to protect against it. So that's what preventative medicine is. So we want to, uh, to use all those, those hormones. You know, the good thing about melatonin, it doesn't suppress your own production. It helps with aging. It protects against oxidation. Uh, I mean, it decreases blood pressure. Uh, it helps with insulin resistance. I mean, what a great, what a great hormone, but yet, uh, most everybody I see that comes in is really not on one, at least not a pharmaceutical grade. So there you go. Those are the ones that are in addition to the testosterone and thyroid for the most part. I mean, we talk vitamin D3 as well, but we've got DHEA, pregnenolone, and melatonin. Those are some of the highlights. There's a lot of other beneficial effects. But the point is, if you don't want those things, don't take them. So Danny could tell everybody to start everything in isolation and only do testosterone feel better, except for my patients. He can't tell my patients that. I want them to have all the anti-cancer properties that I can give them. Before I jump in, what's your, your typical starting dose for people? Because I know right now they're going to be asking, well, how much, how much well, does come see pressure? me to know that. You need to come see me to know that. Okay, good. So, <laughs> okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you, but we're buddies, okay? You can't take DHEA, right? Uh, right. 
Because so you happen to be one of the few that you, you break out in Ankthy, right? I break so, yeah. out. And, and guess who else can't take DHEA? Dr. Ruzier. Even when we take small doses, I get cystic acne on the chest. And I never had any any acne on my chest ever. When, it, when you were younger, you had to get acne on your face, pimples here and there. But uh, but when I took DHEA, it was cystic acne on the chest. As soon as I stopped it, it mm -hmm. went away. Uh, when I took DHEA, my DHEA went up to uh, over 800. When I don't take it, it's between four and 500. I guess it's the pregnant alone. You know, I, I just simply, I don't, I certainly didn't become deficient in it uh, by being on testosterone. So I can tolerate the pregnant alone well, but I can't not tolerate DHEA. That's why I say, if you can't tolerate it, don't take it. It's, it's okay not to take it, but if you can take it, you want the beneficial effects of it. So I've had had some messages, PMs from guys in the group that said, you know, I went to see Keith and he wants me to start all these things, but I know you say the one at a time stuff. And I've clarified my position because I, I don't think I was clear enough. I said, if you've got a guy like Keith Nichols as your doctor and he's giving you all this stuff, by all means, take all the stuff. And if any type of issue develops and you say, you know, I'm, I'm experiencing this, he'll know based on experience, okay, you're probably intolerant to this, but he wants to get you feeling good right off the bat. Wait, um, then, but not but, just feeling good. There's only two feel good ones. I want to give them the anti -K I want to give them the preventative medicine, the yes, preventative yes. health. It's from the very beginning. Yes. Right. Yeah. So the issue was with guys like me, and there are other guys in the group that are intolerant to certain things. Like I've tried Pregnolone at virtually every single dose, and it's literally the same thing. After three, four days, a libido and erection just goes. I've tried different brands. I've tried. I just one of those people, like Darko, you mentioned. He's, he's the exact same type. My my argument is. I spent two years playing around with the different dosages of all these things, never thinking of, could I just be intolerant to something? And I never really thought to see what impact was each of these things having. So once I said, let me get back to basics and do only testosterone. By the way, you said that I mentioned the group that you can do testosterone only, you don't need other stuff. I, that I've never said. No, I would personally- it's, it's, it's in isolation, you know, if you get on- okay. Yeah. Like I would love to take everything. I would love to, because I know it's good for me. I, I, I realize that. But when I got back to basics and I got my free T levels optimized, I didn't touch anything else. And I was feeling better. I'm like, okay, I feel good now. I'm at a good place. Let me add DHEA and make sure that, that I don't feel worse or that something's not happening. Okay. I'm not getting any acne. Everything's cool. I'm going to bump up to 50. Everything's great. Actually, my libido interactions are even better. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to stick around here for a little while. Everything's great. Perfect. Let me now throw in pregnolone because I know it's good for me. I know I might not even see a benefit, but I know it's good for me. Let me throw this in now and see what impact it has. And with me, like I said, I, it, 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 didn't, it, it was unfavorable to me. And I said, well, there's the damn problem. Here was something I was taking for two years that I that worked for me. But like I'm saying, had I had a doctor like you back then, and I was reported this, you might've said, oh, you're probably one of those few types that are intolerant to uh, pregnolone. You know, drop your dose, try that out. If not, just stop taking it entirely or, or whatever the case may be. And it, and it, so, and it, hap it happens, it, it happens. You know, I can't take it. It happens. You know, and it happens you know, and, you just, but, and you just stop the most likely offender and you, and you go from there. But, yeah. um, so but, you know, we also all these arguments were, were, were done from, all of these arguments that I did were done from my own personal experience of having had taken everything, having been one of those types that didn't respond well, going back to basics, adding one at a time. And I'm like, well, there, now I've got it figured out. So I just kind of said, well, maybe everyone should be applying that type of logic. But then after meeting you, you're like, Danny, you're like in the, maybe in the 2%, 98%, right. I can give everything and they're fine. So right. if that's the case, right. you know, do it that so way. As a physician, you want to give your patients the, the most benefits they can get as quickly as you can. And so really you are, and I am, even with DHA, and a DHA in women, yes, the, they can be very sensitive to it. But look, you do learn over years of what you're going to see with some of these hormones, but, but you are trying to maximize their health in the long term. That's what you're really looking for. Yes, we can make everybody ultimately feel good now. If they give it enough time, let you get the blood levels up and up. Most guys, as I tell the secret to optimization is getting the levels up to a level that it's gonna, you know, improve symptoms and then giving it time to work. I mean, it takes those two things. And, and so we, we try to do that. And so, like you said, Danny, 98% uh, of people, they, they tolerate them all at once. And other things go into that as well. You know, you wanna factor in their, 
time and money for the patient. Uh, you know, when you're starting testosterone, you know, you're gonna get blood levels in four to six weeks. If you don't add DHEA, when you do add DHEA, you're gonna have to get blood work for that until you get it optimal. So you may be in, increasing their blood testing uh, significantly. So you try to condense it down. I think Dr. Matsky uh, posted a good uh, post a day or two ago, and it was with regard to testosterone. And I have his same attitude, and I was glad to see that he has it. Uh, a lot of guys, like the one that was posted on Facebook today that uh, was in the article on T Nation about how you to start, he said you should start really low at like 100 milligrams and yeah. kind of work up. Well, Matt's, Dr. Matsky posted the other day that he starts at a high dose and can always go down because he wants to get them feeling better as rapidly as he can so they can get them up and moving. I have that same attitude. Rizio has that same attitude. And so I start with a, with a, with a decent dose. And then I can move up or down, of course, based on laboratory studies and how they feel. But, uh, but starting at a low dose doesn't always motivate these men. They're going to want to change some things uh, too quickly if they're not feeling better. So I, uh, it's just different attitudes. So you can start things individually and work from there. There's no problem that if one of my patients said, nope, I just want to do one at a time. Okay. If they came in and said, look, I just want testosterone and thyroid or testosterone vitamin D3. Okay. I mean, you can't force anybody to take anything and you're certainly not going to not treat them as a patient if they choose not to take these things. That, that's perfectly fine, but you hope you do a good enough job teaching them about the health benefits that they'll want to take them all and focus on their long-term health, not just the feel good now. You know, you, you talk to all these people that wish they would have done something 20 years earlier that now have cancer or, or you know, have a disease that they're not going to get rid of. Uh, you really are trying to help people in that regards. Uh, so that's, that's my take on it. There's no right or wrong way. It's whatever you're going to do and do consistently that that's the right way. Well, Guys, I just want to re reiterate something really, really fast. What Keith just said for everybody watching, why is he giving everything at once? He says, I want to make sure that they're healthy as soon as possible. And I don't want to have to just test one and have them come in for bloods and have a consult with me that I got to charge the money and they got to pay for the labs. And they're going to, now I'm going to add the pregnenolone and they're going to come back in four or six weeks and they're going to have more bloods. They're going to pay for it and have another consult. I don't want them to spend the money. I'm just going to put them on everything because 98% of the time it's fine. They'll have the one consult, they'll have the one lab, and then we can follow up later and that's it. He's trying to avoid people from spending or wasting their money needlessly. If you have a doctor of your own, make sure that the doctor of your own is doing that or look for a doc like Keith Nichols or someone that has that type of, uh, that type of uh, approach. And it's the same way with testosterone, Dr. Matsky. Start them out at a dose that's good, that you see from a clinical standpoint over years of practice that get most of the men better. And for me, that's, you know what that is? That's 30 milligrams a day to start with. I was started at 70 milligrams. Yep. And then they brought me up to 90 milligrams and then they brought me up to hundred milligrams and none of it was working. I'm like, guys, I'm a problem solver. Can we try something? Cause everything you've tried so far has had no effect. Let's go to an extreme. Let's do something stupid. Let's do something wild. Give me 200 milligrams. And they just oh, 200 milligrams. Let's give me 200 milligrams and let's see what that does. And if I respond, you know, then we can say, okay, well, at least we're having a response here and then we can adjust and go up or down. That's a blast. You know? But look so at the time and look at the time and money it took you to get to 200 milligrams though danny that's what we're trying exactly. to say well, exactly. that's what we're you trying know. to say that's what we're trying to say we can always go down we can always go down i can't even remember what dose i started at i mean i really don't i don't even i don't even pay attention to the dose i just put on what uh, keith recommended with the clicks i don't even pay attention to it to be honest what was it what did i start at keith uh, Hunter, well, you, you'd already been on testosterone for many years. You're on a decent dose of injection. So you started on 150 milligrams twice a day, transferably. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it just, that, that I really don't, I focus on other stuff. I, I one of the things that I was going to say, um, before that I've noticed is, and <clears throat> I don't want to sound and make this sound the wrong way, but uh, a lot of the like issues and stuff that I see people posting about are not real issues. <laughs> I mean, they're stuff that, I mean, if it was me, I would just suck it up and <laughs> run right through it and keep going and not think again about it. But I see these constant things posted over and over again about uh, details that I just don't even see as being relevant when it comes to actually um, living life. It's, I, I, do, do any of you guys see that about? I see it all day. <laughs> I'm just thinking to myself, just bite the bullet, suck it up, 
you get through the soreness of your workout, wait another week or two, see how, how things go then and just rock and roll with life. I mean, uh, things are too short to, to focus on small things that you have control over. And one of them is you sort of do have control over which state you want to keep yourself in. If you're feeling in a bad state, you're negative or whatever, do something, exercise, get out of it. I mean, change the scenery that you're around. So I think, uh, the preventative medicine aspect was something that was a little bit foreign to me as well. And I, it was foreign to you as, as well, Danny, I, I, I believe I uh, came in with an open mind and, and listened. But as soon as I got to the practice and started uh, learning more stuff about how Keith treats, um, it just makes so much more sense because when I see some um, anti-aging uh, uh, practitioners and stuff like this, and they're doing different, <clears throat> different things. It, some of the stuff that I see just really doesn't make sense now. So from a long-term health perspective, when patients come into the practice and when I start doing consultations as, as well, my main goal is going to be what their health is going to be in 20 years, what it's going to be in 30 years, 40 years on the nutrition, on the genetic testing, all that stuff to make sure that they have their bases covered. And we'll never be able to solve those nitpicky things that come up that, that are just not really meaningful to health. They're just daily living uh, issues that, that um, I think uh, sort of become resolved when people grow older a little bit and become more mature. So it's just uh, oh, one of those things I saw. I hope that didn't piss anybody off. No. Nah. Yes. Stephen, I know that we're we're deep into this this hour, and I know you always want to cut stuff off at an hour. I can say as long as I you, you want, but if you've got a lot of these bro science questions lined up, maybe you can like throw them out there, and we can give like one answer, or one sorry, one sentence or two sentence responses, and well, hit up. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, um, Dan Danny uh, made a post in the group asking for a lot of these uh, bro science uh, facts. <laughs> Uh, to debunk them, but of course, a lot of these things are always repeated and repeated. And I guess most of us know, yeah, what is bro science because, yeah, they, they just threw it in that uh, post. But I wouldn't worry about that. We can always uh, go back to that later. But I already have some uh, interesting questions in the QA now if you uh, want to go to those mm -hmm. first. Um, sure. First thing that gets uh, over and over um, asked again. Uh, Danny, because you started it in one of the podcasts you did with me, uh, you explained about uh, how you uh, kept a little bubble of air into the syringe to inject uh, yes. the whole thing. And yes. that um, question keeps on uh, popping up and repeating itself. Isn't it bad to inject that little bit of air into yourself, as described by uh, you, Danny? What, yeah, what no, it's about that, Danny. It's not. If you're injecting, you know, if you're if you've got a you're injecting straight into a vein, and you got an air bubble going into vein, that can yes, that can definitely cause an issue, and it it wouldn't even just be just a small air bubble that would kill you. It would have to be like a significant amount of air being pushed into this vein. When we're doing these injections, we're either doing them sub Q, we're going into the fat, or we're going straight into the muscle. So you're going into, you know, something like the delt or, uh, you know, my case, if I do, uh, when I was doing uh, intramuscular injections, I would go ventral gluteo. There's very little, there's not any major blood arteries or stuff there. Um, so you can safely do there. You don't even really have to aspirate anymore uh, from everything I've been reading. The whole thing about aspirating in some of these locations isn't really necessary anymore. Um, I'm trying to think, how do I... The, the reason that I was doing it is that when you are doing daily injections and you're drawing with a big needle, like I draw with like a, an 18, an 18 gauge needle, you got to figure out how much you're going to wind up with in your syringe. And you got to calculate, you know, how much of this do I, do I want to go in? So I would make sure that the amount in my syringe was the exact amount I wanted to inject. So I'm like, okay, well, how do I inject this, this exact amount? And if I followed it up with just a touch of air, the air would make sure that all the liquid is pushed through. Um, and that was it. The other thing is that when you're doing these daily injections, if you're going to leave that little bit of, of um, amount that's left over in, in, the, in the needle every single day, uh, there's like 
uh, was it 0.05 ml in the syringe every day. But if over a course of a month, like that adds up to a lot, that adds up to a lot of waste. And I didn't want to waste it. I wanted to use every damn drop of it. So I said, how do I go about doing this uh, and getting all of it? And it's been a non-issue. I've been doing it now that, that way with the air pocket thing for well over a year. I've never had an issue. Uh, I've even started experimenting with int intramuscular again. Uh, it, it's a non-issue. Don't worry about it. Uh, yeah. You can put a 0 0.5 ml, you know, that much in your syringe, a little bit of air in between the plunger and the actual oil pushes everything through. When you push through, you're going to hear it's like it, the air coming out. It's, it's fine. It's yeah, not that's one of those myths um, that injecting air is so bad for you. So yeah. oh, I've probably had uh, 10,000 injections and I've never had an issue. So all muscle type. So there we go. No, no worries there. Another question from the chat box is, um, have you ever seen uh, testosterone causing sleep disturbances? Because um, the person that asked the question said, when I started using tea cream at night, my CPAP machine and my experience is that I get less sleep and drowsy during the day. Any experience there, Scott or Keith? I, I have it. I've experimented with higher doses just to see, because I like to experiment. I try to a higher dose of, of tests, much higher than what I was taking. I just wanted to see what the outcome was. And one of the things I noticed for me is I didn't sleep nearly as well as I sleep on my regular TRT dose. It just kind of stimulates me in some way. I'm not sure, but I've, I've done it several times, several little experiments like that. And in every single case, that's the one thing I notice is my sleep isn't as good. As soon as I bring my TRT dose back, like suddenly my sleep is fine again. So, but that's just me. Other guys can probably take a gram of test a week and sleep like a baby. We're probably all different in that regard. Any um, reply there, Keith or Scott? That's a good answer. Whatever they get, they get, and you adjust around it. That's just all you can do. That's why you can't take a cookie cutter approach. You know, there's some guys that, that do have that, and uh, you know, you just you just work around it. Uh, you, you can take a higher dose in the morning and a lesser dose at night, or you can even do it once a day. There's no roadmap. There is no recipe to follow. You got to find out what works for the individual. There are a couple of guys that I have that, because of various issues, believe it or not, they're applying three times a day in a lower dose just because of certain individual issues that they say that they have. You don't, you don't argue the point with them and you just, you know, I mean, sometimes you, you do have to say, look, you need to give certain things that we talked about earlier, give it time to, to give your body a chance to acclimate things will work themselves out. But in issues like this last question of anxiety at night, fine, it's okay to lower the dose. There's nothing wrong with that at night. You don't even have to take a nightly dose if you don't want to. Uh, like I said, there's there's no roadmap. You're not going to crash if you only take it once a day by any stretch of the imagination. So, you know, work with your physician. Let your physician work with you. I mean, I, you just have to sit down and talk to them and figure out what's going to work for them and that they're going to be confident that it's going to work for them. And you just you just have to some, – some guys are a little more difficult than others, and it takes more work in those guys, but you just have to, just have to work at it. Mm -hmm. One of the issues I had with the cream um, was – waking up in the sometimes at night with an erection so, and that was <laughs> the only wild. thing that yeah you're so welcome most I mean, people you're welcome think that's that. a problem <laughs> you get them only during the night i have them all day what's i think you're see and that's scott's one of those trouble kind of patients you, you give yeah. him an erection every night he's going to complain i mean come yeah. on come on guys really <laughs> But <laughs> probably some nocturnal emission. <laughs> <laughs> okay, another question was uh, in the chat box, uh, what is the best supplement to lower cortisol? What is your experience? Uh, ashwagandha, maybe? That's what uh, Anthony Labras did a podcast about that. Uh, what is it? A couple well, ago about what's ashwagandha? the reason for reducing cortisol? Maybe... People think it um, it makes uh, testosterone um, spike a bit higher. Not anything to do with adrenals or anything. Well, usually it's adrenals, high cortisol, high stress. That's why you optimize all your other hormones, DHEA. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, someone asked, um, 
Is gyno um, surgery worth it to get um, for higher estrogen for the benefits only? That's a bit it's of gyno a surgery. surgery. Yeah. I, if someone has true uh, gynecomastia, then a surgical procedure is the only way that they're going to have the removal of that lump. It's true. It's it's just how it is. Tiny tissue. Uh, Make sure you don't let it go on too long. You want to catch it in the first three stages or so, or, you know, that you, you don't want to, don't let, let it get I too think bad. The question was, is it worth getting gyno surgery so that I can make use of and benefit from higher levels of estrogen? Yeah, that's it. Would it be worth getting the surgery? Was that? Are we assuming that they have gyno? Well, we're making the assumption. Gyno? We're making the assumption that higher levels of E two are going to make the gyno worse. And I, I can attest to that. My right now, my gyno is high, my, my sorry, my E two is higher than it's ever been, and my gyno is at the lowest level it's ever been. Surprisingly, so I've had some issues of mastalgia, couple mastalgia with the uh, with the uh, cream, but no real true gyno other than mastalgia. But um, but if I were if I had gyno, mm -hmm. I would have the surgery, I'd get rid of it, be done with it, and then I would leave my estrogen alone to get the long term health benefits of the estrogen. I'll just tell you that outright. Anything that I could do where I could take my testosterone at an optimal dose and leave my estrogen alone, I would do. Well, you know, I think uh, some of these guys, uh, any type of nipple sensitivity they have, or any type of swelling at all. Um, they automatically start to think that they're developing gyno or um, they now it's been in my experience because I actually have had it. The this the mass is behind your nipple is about the size of a nickel or a quarter. And uh, hormones sometimes will aggravate it. But as far as actually reducing the size, it, I mean, the only way to reduce the size is to have it removed because that mass is always going to be there. At least that's how it was for me. Uh, so um, I was lucky enough to have the military chop off one of my nipples. <laughs> okay, another interesting question, and I don't know if I dare to ask it, um, Keith. Will the doctors that are in our Facebook group be mentioned on Jay Campbell's new platform, Man's Healthcare? What can you say about that? Jesus. Oh, I would hope not, because uh, I don't hope. I hope not. We're desperate enough to do that. Uh, really, this is a uh, this has been done before. Uh, Suzanne Summers has, uh, you know, uh, a website like that. Uh, I like her. She's good. I mean, but uh, but uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, but nonetheless, uh, what that is is uh, Jay and uh, William will promote physicians as being the best. And uh, you know, being experts, if those physicians pay them for the referrals. So what you're going to get is you're going to get the best physician that's willing to pay somebody for referrals. They may be the worst physician in the world, but they're going to be listed as the best because they're going to pay somebody for referrals. So uh, specifically, Jay and William. And so yes, it'll be free to the public, but I want the public to understand that what you're getting are physicians that are willing to pay money so that they can promote them. It's not about being the best. Now they may, somebody may sign up that, that's great. I don't know anybody that has signed up, uh, but uh, just be rest assured that you could be the greatest physician in the world at that hormone replacement. If you, and you won't be on that side if you don't pay to be on. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's something people need to, to, to factor in, uh, you know, so you could be the worst physician at TRT but of course they vet you with these simple little questions, but I don't know how somebody that is not a physician that, uh, well, let's not say that. Uh, hey, my questions weren't simple, Keith. Those were my questions and I worked real hard at them. I mean, but you know, you could just <laughs> learn from watching your podcast, the answers. All you have to do is go to the Lifted Dermatologist channel and look at some videos that he's done with you and look at his Facebook and all the questions are answered. It's your, it's your cliff notes to that. So and just because uh, you answer them properly doesn't mean that that's what you actually do in real life. That's, what and, that's you know. and that is nothing, in my opinion, just my opinion, that is kind of just, you know, smoke and mirrors. It's just to say, to say that we vetted them. But if you write a check, you're vetted. Believe me, you write a check, you're going to be vetted. Guys, if anyone watching here, if any of you, if any of you are still somehow have this notion that you're still a fan of Jay Campbell, please 
go see his Twitter feed. Please go see his Twitter feed because just today, just today he posted that mm. school shootings are not real. They're staged. It's all staged. It's all, it's all staged. And someone was talking about hurricanes. as ah, it's fake news. Guy thinks school shootings are staged. What? Wow. School shootings never happened? Uh, uh, guys, please jump. stay away from this guy. Danji and I have six kids between us, and I think that that's kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for me. I've tried to keep quiet. I've had some good and bad with Jay, but that today, I, I just don't. I, I don't understand that. That he's just time. he's gone, people. He's gone. Just please, so anywhere else. Anybody, <laughs> go anywhere else. Well, anybody that would post something like that, I would hope that a, any respectful physician would think twice about having any association at this point. Well, that. You know, there's a point here about social media influencers. If you look at the the individual that Danny mentioned, um, he's a walking dichotomy. He is. And the face that you see on social media is not the actual face to live in person. And one of the issues that I have um, that I've come that I've struggled with with social media influencers is that they have they are always in a dichotomy like of what i've talked about uh this whole uh, podcast they always make claims that are either black and white but there's some claims that you just can't back up that's why when people question why i never ever say well this is 100 percent this way or this is 100 percent that way it's because there has to be some uncertainty there nothing is never black and white but um any type of social media influencer that makes claims in this manner, it's either one way or the other, I'm the expert, or uh, uh, there is no expert, be cautious of them and avoid them like the plague. Uh, because uh, this is where a lot of what you would think where bro science would be sort of, uh, uh, I guess, stifled, it actually can become worse in situations like that. So that's just my take on it. I saw that in uh, the post and that guy Jones, there's a conspiracy theorist, Jones. Do you know who I'm talking about, Danny? Yeah. But I forgot uh, his first name, but uh, he was just sued tremendously for making comments about mass shootings. The families actually sued this guy and um, uh, took everything he had. So you got to think a question the, the mental state of somebody that's going to post something like that. Did so you agree, guys, that Jay had some good books written and that he maybe now abuses his authority or whatever to to make money with, with his kind of um, websites or posts or whatever? Alex Jones. You mean books written by other people? Yeah. I, he didn't I write those books. Yeah, there's... So that sort of answers that question in short firm. Yes. Okay. So one, one more question I got. Um, someone said, it could be me, I have been accused of being bold due to high DHT levels because of my TRT. So several questions there. Does TRT in general cause higher DHT? Does transcrotal test cream cause higher DHT than injections? And is that something to worry about? Must we monitor DHT levels and control them? Do we risk boldness because of DHT due to our TRT? So well, there's a lot of questions, but all about the same thing, I guess. Scott, yeah? Uh, I just want to set the stage for this. There's two natural agonists of the androgen receptor, which we already covered in that previous podcast. That's testosterone and dihydrotestosterone. Why would you want to block or lower DHT? It's a natural agonist. Target tissues are target tissues, and I'll let Keith take over from here. I think Danny's got this one on. I mean, he's answered it so many times. But I mean, <laughs> genetically predisposed, you're going you're gonna to lose your hair. Uh, no matter what method you get it, you're going to lose your hair quicker. On Don't do testosterone in, in any way if you're afraid of losing your hair. If you're predisposed to lose it, you're going to lose it quicker. But, uh, but yes, transcrotal is going to raise your DHT higher than injections, and you'll lose it faster than you would lose it on injections. But you're going to lose it both ways. That's it. That's it. Does the, is it more on the cream? Yes, it's more on the cream. 
if you have a full, thick head of hair, if you think you're going to rub the cream and you wake up looking like Stephen <laughs> tomorrow, no, it's not. You know, I had, I grew up with a full, thick, really thick head of hair. Uh, and I started, started thing, sitting out a little bit way before TRT. I mean, you can see I'm, you know, I shave it down now just because I like the look, but I got hair. I, I'm just thinning out a little bit over here. And when I started taking TRT, uh, the hair loss accelerated a little, a little bit. It was just a little bit more noticeable than it was before, but it wasn't like this drastic, it's just falling out. So if your hair is thinning out now and you're not on TRT, well, you can already conclude that in five years from now, you're going to have less hair than you did today. You know, if you take TRT, you might have just a little bit more less hair than you did today. And that's, you know, but if you have a full thick head of hair, you'll probably still have a full thick head of hair in five years. You know, some people have never had a pimple in their life and they can take 200 milligrams of DHA every day and they're fine. You know, uh, I had acne when I was a kid, when I was a teen and I take DHA and I get the occasional zit. I got a big sucker on my face today. I get them every now and then, you know, but I get one and it's gone for when I have nothing for a couple of weeks and I get it again, but it's not enough for me to say I'm not going to take it. It's what you're genetically predisposed to. If you had it at one point, you'll get it maybe a little bit worse, but I'm talking a little bit worse. We're not talking 10 times worse. So, you know, it's, it's a not non-concern. Exactly. Well, you don't could just go uh, Dr. Picogram either. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you guys. I think we covered all the questions we had tonight, the prepared ones and the Q&A. So we are at uh, one hour, six minutes. So that's great. Okay, thank you so much again. Anything more you wanted to add, uh, Scott and Keith, maybe about your uh, research that's starting up now? Well, we're in the uh, process of uh, putting in all the paperwork um, to uh, get uh, an IRB established to start running clinical trials. Uh, uh, Keith, well, uh, we are both working on a uh, presentation for a conference. Which conference is that, Keith? Uh, it's uh, be the one of the World Link uh, literature reviews. So we're going back through uh, a, a meta-analysis, uh, a recent one on estrogen that uh, found it, uh, uh, some unfavorable effects in women, uh, postmenopausal women. So we're doing that. Um, trying to uh, think of any, what else, Keith? Can you think Nothing of anything? We're, uh, we're trying to get the groundwork going to uh, do our first major research project besides we do want to do the pharmacokinetics, but to treat men with symptoms, mm -hmm. no matter what their levels are and monitor their response. And that actually, that the, the groundwork for that for that writ literature was written about by Morgenthaler, actually. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, do what he recommended be done. Mm -hmm. That study soon we'll have um, we should have a, a case study um, in maybe in three three months or so, three or four months. We're gonna have a case series that's gonna be released into the literature. So that's uh, our uh, one of the first uh, pieces we're gonna release. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Danny, Thanks, Keith, Scott. Talk to you next time. All Cheers. the best, guys. How are you going, guys? Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.